Giant monsters summoned from the depths of the unknown. Horrific hell creatures to menace all of mankind. They walk. They kill. From the mad minds that brought you in occurrence at Howling Crater and Jungle Tomb of the Mummy Bride, Planet X Games is back, and they're here once again to put the grind back in Grindhouse, this time with their brand new Kickstarter, Escape from Skullcano Island. Escape from Skullcano Island is a brand new high-level adventure module for 5th edition to challenge even the most experienced and stalwart adventurers. Something terrible is happening on this strange prehistoric place, and the fate of all mankind rests on the shoulders of those few daring enough to brave it. Dare you face these gigantic monsters that seek to obliterate mankind and crush the kingdoms of man under their clawed feet. So join us on this titanic thrill ride of kaiju-rific adventure and check out Escape from Skullcano Island by Planet X Games, May 11th on Kickstarter. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. The only thing that glows blue in the clubhouse is his replica of Sting, Stu Horvath. (laughs) You're going to make the people think that there's an armory in there. Isn't that exactly what we want them to think? Oh, that's true. It is fortified, and we have ninjas. And a moat. (laughs) So how are you? Pretty good. We're going to talk about another one of my favorite fantasy franchises, The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, so I have The Lord of the Rings adventure game from Iron Crown Enterprises here. This is essentially the beginner's box or starter set for MURP, Middle Earth Role Playing. Iron Crown Enterprises starts MURP in 1984. The idea is initially, even before MURP actually comes out, they put out these Middle Earth supplements which were sort of system agnostic. And the idea was that like D&D nerds who want to play in Lord of the Rings can. And so you have Mori and Bree and there's little setting books. Because D&D didn't have the rights to use Middle Earth in all its denizens. Yeah, somehow this little tiny company snagged the rights. But then once they got them, they didn't really know what to do with it. Yeah. Eventually they put out a box set which is sort of a lighter version of their house system, which was the Rollmaster system, which is extremely complicated. And MURP is slightly less extremely complicated. And in 1991, after a second edition of MURP, they finally decided that maybe we should get a starter box kind of of going, you know, like an easier entry. And honestly, I just flipped through it again. It's still pretty complicated. And that's the thing, man. As much as there are people who like that crunch, you know, crunch should be reserved for like Raisin Bran and other kinds of cereal, not your games. Yeah, and it's better than Merp. It's, I think, more playable than Merp, but it is still super crunchy. Now, box-wise, I'm looking at the box now. Does it fit nicely against your D&D boxes? No, it's bigger. Sort of obnoxiously so. And in fact... It doesn't sit nicely against my Merp box sets, which really aggravates me. Oh, no. Yeah. How terrible. It's far bigger. But take a look at that cover, Hambone. Oh, the cover is so good. The cover is ridiculous. Angus McBride did so much cover art for Merp and the Lord of the Rings adventure game that I feel like on his back was the success of the line for over a decade. I pretty much think I bought this just for the cover. It's the famous scene from Return of the King where Eowyn is facing off against the Witch King over Theoden's sort of collapsed. He's pinned under the horse and Merry's there with his sword and she's about to say like, you know, I'm a lady and I can stab you dead. And it's like one of my favorite moments in the books. And like McBride does such a great job of having him like feel like he's got mass but there's nothing there. Like the iron crown is just floating Floating in his head. Oh, it's so good. And he's got the mace. Ah, it's like, it's just such a fantastic painting. It really is. And of course it sits atop the classic. It's leather ish (laughs) binding, Yeah, but it's a box, but it looks like it's bound to leather with a picture just placed on top of it. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's not like a book, but it's supposed to look like a tome. 
Yeah, man, design back then was real tough. And also, that scene has very little bearing on the game because it's an introductory game that takes place in Brie and, like, your hobbits and elves. And, like, the initial game, the scenario is set up as sort of like a light choose-your-own-adventure with light role-playing elements. So, like, they at least had that idea going for them. There's two booklets. There's the adventure and a guidelines book, which is a very, like, light-sounding name for what is rather... A heavy system for a beginning game. Yeah, I feel like they're kind of underselling it. Yeah. So in the box, you get book of character profiles that I'm not really sure at this point how it fits in with everything else. You get some dice. I don't know what dice because I've long since absorbed them into my general box of dice. And folks, for those listening at home, on the back of the box, it lets you know everything that's in there. So you would think that we could be like, well, it comes with this kind of dice. The box just says dice. Dice. Yep. That's It's the last thing on the list. I see two six-sided dice, but oh, I don't know. There might have been others. Yeah. One of the cool things about it that I loved uh, when I got it is that it comes with paper cutout standees for characters. Oh, that's fun. I love them. Oh, just like the Marvel role-playing yes. game. Yes, and the second edition Merp box set also had little fold-up dudes. I love miniatures. Miniatures are cool. Paper play stuff is never going to be as sexy as a miniature, but I really love paper cut out things like that even if you don't use them you know it really depends on the art man because i've seen some miniatures of course that are just they're breathtaking and like the skill and time it takes to paint those things to make them look their best it's masterwork it really is masterwork yeah that said sometimes if you're not going to be able to get that far sometimes a good draw on a little piece of paper so you know where you are like it's not going to really ruin the immersive process for you because yeah. it's still a paper map and you got all that great art in the monster manuals and stuff oh, you could just no. like photocopy it and shrink it down mm. uh, you know but anyway one of the things that i think is kind of interesting is is that the system even though it, it is a starter system and significantly stripped down it is compatible with merp and they kind of did it so that you play this and then you get merp and merp sort of expands on all the concepts that they've already laid out considering the property and how many people love lord of the rings and how many people would really want to play in middle earth i just think that it's too heavy a game and i don't think lord of the rings adventure game even though they did finally get to put lord of the rings on the cover of a box right which i think was a smart move i don't think it sold very well there were two more adventures that come out and they're both choose your own adventure style the dm has the adventure like the players don't right i read the thing and then it gives me two or three options and you know walks me through the combat and it's very hand holding and it is good for introducing you to the system and holding your hand through the system i just think that the system is just this says ages 10 and up and like no no like there's a lot of rules for 10 and up and yes this is 20 years later 30 years later and i get that i get that we're looking back at something and kind of judging it but i do think that we do a better job in the industry of creating beginner stuff now. I know people love your crunch. I know you do. I I, And I I like a little bit of crunch, and I like the idea of crunch, but a lot of people don't like crunch. Here's the thing. Years ago, my little cousins knew that I played Dungeons & Dragons. They wanted to try Dungeons & Dragons, and they were all at varying different ages. And around the 10-year-old age... Even on a D, like a basic D20 system, it was still a little too much more attention than the kid wanted to put into a game. Yeah. You know, most kids, to be fair, just want to walk around and hit things with their weapons and call it a day. Yep. Now, granted, you, you do get some kids who are much younger than that playing Dungeons and Dragons. And it's one of those things that, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a family member who's going to walk you through it from a very young age, it could be a very cool experience. It could be a very cool, like, learning and growing together experience. Yeah. You know, that said, for basic D&D, I think what they have now is something that you could teach to, like, 10-year-old kids easily. Because they have broken it down so basic that... Literally anyone could play Dungeons and Dragons as it stands now. Yeah. I also like the idea more and more about system agnostic settings where you could take something like a D&D or an easily understandable RPG that generally anybody can relate to and play and you could slap it in the Lord of the Rings world. Yeah. Which I think around the time this came out, system agnostic stuff wasn't as groovy and friendly. It was almost non-existent, really. I mean, the original supplements for Merp, like the Moria Bree books, were fairly system agnostic. And I can't think of anything else that was really like that at the time. But it wasn't something that was really embraced by people. And partly that was just because everybody needed to have their system. There was like a system arms race at the time. Everybody And everybody was 
looking for a really crunchy, super crunchy system. And by 91, 92, like the industry was moving away from that, not as rapidly or with results like what we have now, but like there was an acknowledgement that crunch was keeping people out of games. Because at the time, D&D and other RPGs were oddly an outsider's game. Yeah. And it's the idea of we don't want to be excluded from things. However, you won't let us do any of this stuff or we feel outside of this. So now we're going to make sure you can't come into our thing. And yep. You're going to become like hyper protective of it. I mean, it was very similar to what the punk rock scene was around that time with all the local kids like starting bands like, well, oh, this is ours. Sure. And unless you fit this criteria, we don't want you in here per se. Exactly. Whereas with the evolution of the hobby and the expansion of technology and the internet and everything else, it got too big to be able to be contained in just one little space. So everything that was even considered to be small and really, you know, refined and tight, it belongs to the world now. Yeah. And this box came out in 1991, which is the same time the first major shift in role-playing games was happening with the release of Vampire the Masquerade and that influx of non-traditional role players and it was just like 91 to 93 94 like all of these old school crunchy games kind of came out and never really found their audiences the way that vampire and, and more story narrative friendly games did and lord of the rings adventure game Merp, ice in general has always historically struggled with this there's things in that crunch that don't feel like middle earth the magic system it's very D D, and like you never see D D like magic in Lord of the Rings. It just doesn't work that way. And it creates like a tonal problem. Specifically to the Lord of the Rings adventure game, it's weird to me that there's all this crunch in a game that should have appealed to everyone who has read a beloved classic like Lord of the Rings. And all of their material is so interesting on like the world setting level. Like they do so much cool work there's like really great artwork they develop everything they name all the nazgul like they invested a lot on the same level as the expanded universe for star wars and i feel like a lot of people have overlooked it and missed out on that because it was sort of you know walled off by crunch i agree and that said i think that there is something very special about the way that games like these are constructed for people who love crunch yeah like if you could find a group of people who want to play a game like this with you holy crap, this is your jam. Yeah. Because it's got every little nuance and nook and cranny that you're looking for to make a game specifically the way that you want to play it. And I think that it's also an amazing thing that they're able to flesh out the characters, the creatures, every little bit that you may have grown up reading those Lord of the Rings books and kind of wondering what these are. And I mean, Tolkien, you know, from what I've read and been told, like he was really good about explaining and detailing everything, but now to be able to give it stats yeah. is a pretty cool thing as well. Now, that said, I also see the other side of it where games need to be able to be played. Yeah. And you might have trouble finding people who are going to want to sit and endure all that crunch with you. It's not for the casual gamer is what I'm saying here. Yeah. It's more for people who are, this is the type of advanced game that we're looking for. We're not just here to roll some dice. We're here to really put our thinking caps on and really enjoy it at a very different level. Yeah. And like... I like crunch. If I thought that our group had the attention span or interest in playing something like super crunchy, like Burning Wheel, I would do that. I would totally run that and have fun with that experience. I don't have any problem with crunch. I don't have any problem with Merp in general. I love those books. They just do so much so well and so lovingly. But I just think that it was a mistake to marry a super crunch game with a super general audience property. Oh, especially around that time. Yeah. yeah. And I think that it was something that they managed to coast for a long time, but it never got the success that it deserved. It deserved to be as popular as the current iterations of Middle Earth role-playing games are. And it's a bummer. It has such a rich history to it. The Middle Earth map for Merp is like just fantastic. It's bigger than the known Tolkien Middle Earth because they wanted to expand the world so that they had room to play. And it's just gorgeous. And I love it so much. But it's not something that I can play. And I know that people do play it and people do love it. But I think you have to kind of acknowledge the fact that it could have been bigger and better and more embraced if it had been an easier system. Which is a tough line to walk because if it was more embraced and it was easier to play, you would get more of it because more people would be playing it. But then you're also potentially going to sacrifice the thing that people who really do love it love about it. So it's kind of a... Yeah, I mean, in this particular case, 
you do have Rollmaster. Like, if you want that crunch, it's there in Rollmaster. And, like, they could have just built a completely different system, you know? Right. And it's like the difference. It, it, you know, I always do this. Chaosium. <laughs> Chaosium, Chaosium, Chaosium. If I say it enough, they'll just send me all their things. Like Beetlejuice, they'll appear. Yeah. Like, you have a fairly crunchy game in Pendragon, but you also have, like, the Prince Valiant game, which is super light and super accessible, which didn't do well because even though like they thought that like oh everybody reads the prince valiant comic it like just didn't capture people's imaginations guys let me just debunk a myth for you right here <laughs> nobody reads prince valiant there i said it yeah but they approached the prince valiant game which was based on a popular general audience property and they made a very general audience weighty game like that game is perfect for people to just pick up and play it's about marrying those two things you know intent and player and doing it right and there's not enough of a difference between Rollmaster Merp and the Lord of the Rings adventure game to like justify all of those different variations of the system like they're not different enough right you know they're all really crunchy <laughs> Yeah, it's not like D&D and advanced D&D. Yeah, like, or even just the difference between the D&D editions. There's levels of crunch there, and you, if you don't like the lightness of 5e, you can go back to a 2e. They're different systems. These aren't, really. Yeah, you can't run three different systems concurrently. Yeah, and all of them super crunchy. Like, you're just marketing the same thing to the same people. All right, Stu, do you have any final thoughts on the Lord of the Rings adventure game box? You know, despite everything that I've said, Angus McBride cover art might be worth the price of admission. Well, there you go, folks. And that was our episode on the Lord of the Rings Adventure Box. Stu, where can the people find you? They can find me on Instagram at VintageRPG, talking about things like the Lord of the Rings Adventure Game. You can find me on the Twitter at Handbreaker. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about professional wrestling. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons. You could also find me on Instagram for my day-to-day adventures in podcasting and in life at John Hambone McGuire. Folks, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. Every one of those little things helps other listeners to find us. You can also check out our Patreon for extra content over at patreon.com slash vintage RPG. So for Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com.